This is a work of political and social commentary. The content of this video is not meant for children under the age of 13. Parental discretion is advised. So, after months of investigations, more months of hearings, weeks of debate and delay, and days of trial in the Senate, we finally know when the vote on the Articles of Impeachment in the Senate will occur. Next Wednesday, the impeachment of Donald Trump will end, one way or another. Currently, the number of credible political pundits who anticipate a conviction is approximately zero. Now, I wonder who could have predicted that. I'm not sure, but here's a link to the playlist of videos I made about this impeachment. Feel free to look back at what I've said about this subject in the past, and decide for yourself. It's all over but the crying, folks. That means it's also time for one final round of Roasted Opinions about the impeachment. It's funny. When a subject of significant political importance shows up, I try to follow the discussion on both sides. Go figure, I have a commentary channel. What happens inevitably is that the discussion reaches a Godwin's Law-like point, where the response from one or both sides is completely predictable based on their political biases. We've reached that point, folks. The first calls for an impeachment began before President Trump was inaugurated. At that point, he wasn't even subject to impeachment yet, because he wasn't president yet. The list of things which people claimed were worthy of impeachment grew every week until finally the House of Representatives passed back into the control of the Democrats and the investigations could really begin. They investigated his business dealings, demanded his tax returns because he wouldn't voluntarily release them. They investigated Russian collusion, claiming that he was in bed with Putin despite the fact that he kept working against Putin's military interventions. They investigated the Steele dossier. They investigated his campaign finances. They even secured a series of convictions on unrelated charges against people who used to work for him. But the issue the official House investigations latched onto, of all things, was a phone call which an anonymous whistleblower referred to the Inspector General and then to Adam Schiff, one of the chief architects of the Trump impeachment. Okay, press pause there. Why did it take so long to start the official investigations in the first place? With that laundry list of supposedly impeachable offenses, why then? The Senate has been in the hands of the GOP throughout this process, and impeachment has always required a significant number of Republican senators to vote to convict in order to be successful. The chances of success have been low, Throughout, why this offense? Why hang everything on it? Why launch the hearings at that time, or for that matter in the first place, if you know that you can't secure a conviction? Could it be because the primary season had begun at that time? The House investigations continued on for months. Meanwhile, the Democratic candidates did not have as much competition with Trump, who was running virtually unopposed for the Republican nomination in the 2020 election campaign. Part of that was because Trump was still attempting to get more of his agenda through Congress. And part of it was because Trump was in defense mode against the accusations levied in the House committees over and over again. Perhaps the length of the investigations was to swing as much sentiment as possible against Trump and build up a head of steam for the impeachment. And perhaps it was to allow a head of steam to build up against Trump in that 2020 campaign. When the articles were voted out, this prompted a serious situation. This is one of the few times when Congress has an overriding reason to set aside all other business of the people in favor of completing just one task. Yet Nancy Pelosi immediately engaged in over a month of failed negotiations with Mitch McConnell in order to guarantee how the trial would be conducted in the Senate. Now, did the Speaker forget that she has no actual role in the conduct of the trial? Because as the next person after the Vice President in line to succeed the President, she actually has a vested interest? At least Mike Pence remembered that he has no role in this. Instead, he stayed out of the discussions between the Senate and the House, and hit the campaign trail. Again, he has a vested interest in the outcome of the trial. He immediately becomes president if Trump is convicted. That's why he doesn't participate, and that's why he left Washington. 
Now, Mitch McConnell, as Senate Majority Leader, has a role to try to remain nonpartisan and ensure a fair trial. Unfortunately for all of us, McConnell was in the invidious position where if he did so, the House managers would run wild during the trial. Remember that during the hearings, no witnesses were called to testify about the president's claims in support of his justification for calling for an investigation into Burisma and Hunter Biden. None. Hunter Biden is off limits because Joe Biden is running for president. The evidence was presented in the trial, which happened just last week. Keep in mind that the House managers have to prove their case in the Senate where there are 53 GOP senators and they need 67 votes to convict. These senators were aware that none of the testimony and witnesses presented in the House investigation actually saw anything directly. The House managers were therefore looking for a Hail Mary in the form of further investigations during the Senate trial. This is why there was a vote over calling further witnesses. The House managers were hoping that the smoking gun witness would come forward. The House came as close as it ever has to finding that smoking gun with John Bolton who wrote a book in which the New York Times reported he claims he was told by Trump to pressure the Ukraine to investigate Hunter Biden. Bolton's claims would confirm that Trump demanded that the aid to the Ukraine be held in exchange for investigating Hunter, which, remember, is off-limits because his dad is running for president. The House managers claimed that they wanted Bolton and several members of the White House staff who had been barred by Trump from appearing in front of the House committees because of executive privilege to come and testify in the Senate. The GOP responded that they wanted Hunter Biden, Joe Biden, and the anonymous whistleblower to appear in exchange. The House managers claimed that the GOP witnesses would accomplish what Trump had attempted to do in the first place, in their opinion, steal the election from Joe Biden. The GOP responded by voting to exclude further witnesses and evidence. The final tally, 51-49, and the calls of a conspiracy to create an unfair trial began. Those calls are right. It was unfair to start calling for impeachment before the president was even inaugurated. It was unfair to demand investigations into every single move that Trump made in the largest fishing expedition in decades. It was unfair to exclude testimony which could have exonerated the president from the hearings. It was unfair to bring charges to trial which amounted to two counts of orange man bed. It was unfair to bring the business of the people to a standstill for years because the president's existence offends other elected officials. And it was unfair to use the most serious congressional duty in the Constitution as a weapon against the incumbent president while he sought re-election. And with the vote to exclude, the Senate has signaled that the House has not proved their case to the satisfaction of enough senators to convict the president. Now, there's still a vote to be cast on Wednesday, but it really is all over but the crying. And it's also a mission accomplished in a way. President Trump has been smeared before the American people, and unlike President Clinton, he's still eligible for re-election. That's why the timing of this circus has been so suspicious to me all along. I believe that the House never intended to successfully impeach Donald Trump. What they intended to do was what happened with Andrew Johnson, the other president who was impeached. They wanted to ensure that Trump is a one-term president by tainting everything that he has done as president as being dirty underhanded partisan politics. The fact that they are using dirty, underhanded partisan politics to do it escapes their attention, I think. Now, should Trump defeat the Democrat nominee, and I think that he can, the Democrats may very well intend to impeach him again. For what? Probably on the grounds of orange man bed. But another scenario is possible, at least in theory. You see, the articles of impeachment are legislation from the House. I've looked, And I can see no prohibition against the House repealing those articles. If the GOP regains control of both houses of Congress, then the newly constituted House can vote to repeal those articles and expunge the congressional record. Nancy Pelosi claimed that Trump was impeached forever. From a legal standpoint, though, if the articles are repealed by the new Congress, then President Trump is no longer impeached. Legally speaking, It never happened. It poses an interesting constitutional question, and such questions are normally the purview of the Supreme Court to make a final decision. The same Supreme Court whose Chief Justice, John Roberts, was impugned by Senator Elizabeth Warren during the trial with a rather obnoxious, inflammatory question. It's all over but the crying, folks. 
The crying will continue for a long time, though, but the results of the impeachment are inevitable now. The people will decide if Trump is a better choice or the Democratic nominee in November. Given the candidates running for the Democratic nomination, I'm not sure that even the massive smear campaign of the impeachment trial will be enough to prevent Trump's re-election.